We are going to continue in our text in Luke today. Luke 15, we started it last week. This is part two of a two-part sermon series. So if you didn't watch last week's, I would encourage you to go back and do that, though I will uh, kind of recap some of it, but I want to pray before we get into God's word because it is a joy to be doing that from this pulpit again. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to study your text today, and we just ask that you would illuminate to our hearts. Show us where we fall as one of the brothers that Jesus talks about in this story and show us how we can come back into relationship with the Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, we, as I said, started a two-part sermon series from Jesus' famous teaching uh, called The Prodigal Son. And last week, we began to read the words of Jesus as he started to talk about two brothers. And we studied the younger brother last week. And the younger brother goes, in the beginning of this story, goes to his father and demands his entire inheritance so that he can leave the family farm and he can go off into foreign lands and spend his money on wild living. The younger son, as we examined last week, has this fundamental belief that I have to leave my father's house and leave my father's farm and leave my father's land if I'm ever going to really live in this life. If I'm going to find this elusive happiness that all of us are searching for, it won't be on my father's farm. It'll be out in the world. It'll be with drugs, sex, and rock and roll, so to speak. And eventually, this lifestyle for the younger son bottoms out. The younger brother starts to stare down the real chance that he's going to starve to death when a famine hits the land he's living in, and he's blown all his money. So he decides that he is going to head home and just try and crawl back to his father and offer to be a servant or a hired hand in his father's field, because at least he figures in his own mind, then he won't starve. He knows what he has done is basically metaphorically spit on his father, so he doesn't expect that he'll be accepted back as a son, but he's hoping to at least not starve. Well, the story doesn't play out that way. We see that as he comes back, the father sees him while he's still far down the lane, and he runs to his son, embraces him. His son confesses his sin, and the father forgives him, and not just restores him to say, you can come live on our farm again. You can be in the family. He says, you are my son, and he puts the family ring on him and puts a robe on him and restores him to the sonship. It's really that reckless love song we just sang played out in real life, that the one that left, the one that got away, the one that was dead and gone comes home, and the father embraces him. And we looked last week how the father's only motivation was love in the midst of that. How he loved people. And I don't want to dive too deep into that again. If you want to hear that sermon, it's up on the website and you can look there. So today we're going to look at Luke 15, 22 through 32, picking up this sermon halfway through as the younger son has returned to the farm. It says in 22, But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it, lest we have a feast. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine, meaning the younger son, was dead and is alive. He was lost and now he's found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older brother was in the field and he came near the house. He heard music and dancing. So he called over one of the servants and asked, what's going on? Well, the servant replied, your brother has come home. Your father has filled the, killed the fatted and calf because he is back safe and sound. The older brother at hearing this became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father and said, Look, all of these years I've been slaving away for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we must celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours is dead, and now he's alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. So that completes this parable of Jesus. This younger son returns home from wild living where his older brother rightly accused him of like, he blew your wealth on prostitutes. And he came home nearly starving because he blew his inheritance. He couldn't find food. And you're welcoming home him home as like a conquering hero. You're throwing a party. 
And his dad says, no, we're celebrating a dead person come back to life. The older brother, you can just imagine, he's walking up from the field, and it's been one of those hard days. He's probably got sweat down his back. He's broken his back for his father, laboring in the field. This is an agrarian society. And he walks up, and he sees the main house full of noise and commotion. And you can just imagine him motioning over to one of the servants, like, what is going on? Why is there a party being thrown? And the last thing in his mind is that my younger brother has returned home. The last thing in his mind is, if my younger brother returns home, the guy who spat on my father, the guy who wasted my dad's property on hookers and partying, that's in the text, you can get mad at the Bible, like, if he, if he did that, that, that we're not going to throw a party for this man. And yet, that is what the text says. And you might be like, why isn't the brother happy? Why isn't he like his dad? And and you have to remember, the older brother has lived through all of this too. He was there when the younger brother demanded his inheritance and set off down the road. He had to watch his father's heart break when he saw his younger brother head off. He most assuredly had to pick up the slack on the family farm when his bro- a younger brother who had chores and responsibilities just headed off. You know that some of that fell on his shoulders. You can just imagine how things probably weren't always easy for the older brother in light of the younger brother's choices and how easily it would lead to bitterness in his heart and even some right, righteous bitterness, it would seem. Disappointment in his younger brother for the foolish actions he took. So this text shows us that the older brother is heading in and sees this party happening, and it totally ticks him off. He refuses to go in, and he finally has that conversation that you know he's been holding back on with the father. Because as it turns out, the older brother isn't finding much joy in living life and working on the father's farm either. The older brother may be more respectful in his actions, but he has some built-up resentment towards his father, too, because it seems life isn't going the way he wants it to, either. You, You just imagine that he's rehearsed this speech to his dad where he saw his younger brother go off and squander living, and he's working away, and he feels like he's not getting what he deserves for working away at it. He says to his dad, this son of yours who was a punk and who squandered your wealth gets a party, and you have never given me the same kind of latitude to even have a get-together with his friends. We don't ask our parents for a young goat when we want to have a party, but that's what's happening in this. He's saying, I want to hang out with my boys, and you haven't even given me a little bit of latitude just to have a little get-together, and you're throwing the ultimate party for this son of yours who's wasted everything, and you've never even given me a little latitude to hang out with my friends. He feels like not only did the younger son get to live it up on the street, not only did he get the hookers in the party in life, now he gets to have the party that I've never gotten. Now he gets celebrated in a way that I've never gotten. I didn't even get one little lamb for a celebration. He got half his inheritance. He got the hookers. He got the partying. He got now you throwing him the biggest party of all. And all I've done is slaved away, the text says, that he tells his dad. I have been your slave. It reveals the older brother's heart towards the son. That I haven't been working for you because I love you. I haven't been working for you out of devotion and out of relationship to you. I've been slaving away, and you almost can hear him saying, and I don't even know why. And the father's response isn't like, dude, you'll get your inheritance. Don't worry about it. I'll make things right financially. Don't worry about all that. The father's response is that he reminds his son, you have misunderstood our relationship the entire time. Listen to verse 31. If you've got your Bible, go there. The father hears his son ranting. He's, you know, the text likely only records a portion of this, and obviously Jesus is just telling a parable, but you can see this yelling from the older son in your mind's eye, and the father finally speaks after his son's done ranting, and all he says is, my son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. My son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. Church, do you see what Jesus is illustrating here? 
The younger brother is the one who leaves the church, leaves the relationship with God, goes out, sends his or her brains out, but then when they finally hit rock bottom, gets welcomed back to the church. It's, it's, it's the baptisms that we hear the testimonies. If I was on drugs, I was doing this, I was living a sinful life, and everyone hoots and hollers, and then the person who's being baptized in is like, well, I've just lived a fairly normal life. I've tried to honor God. I've just never been baptized. People are like, oh, that's okay, cool, I guess. We've seen it play out in the church. We've seen people who have lived, quote-unquote, the moral life. The older brother represents those who stayed in the church, who followed all the rules. The text says that, that the older brother always was obedient to the father's rules. They've worked hard, but at some point, life didn't shake out the way they thought it would for them, and they grew bitter. The older son, if you're thinking in the church world, he served on all the boards. He's taken his turn on the riding mower. He's served in the kids' ministry. He served in VBS. He's tried to tithe and live generously. The older son has made sure that their life reflected what they thought it was supposed to look like, what they thought the father wanted, but yet life still wasn't giving him what he wants, right? Because as soon as there's an offense, he was immediately like, this is what you haven't given me. The only reason that's there is if he hasn't, if he's been harboring that bitterness of like, I haven't gotten out of this life what I've wanted from it. There was resentment from the younger brother because you can just sense, why do we celebrate resentment towards the younger brother? Like, why do we celebrate him? He's made such poor choices and now we're throwing him a party? Why does the church stand up and clap to the person who's been in jail and been on drugs when the person who served in the church their whole life seemingly goes unnoticed? It's easy to see how resentment could build. Like, man, I've never gotten a party from my church. I've never got a standing ovation, and all I've ever done is tithed and served on every board that's ever been asked to me. So you mean for me to get a little recognition, I just needed to go sleep with a hooker and do some drugs? We might not say it so boldly, but that's what the older brother seems to be representing. This attitude can so easily creep into church people. And we don't say it bluntly, but it comes out when you see it in the attitude of a church person. When that new person comes in and they have some new ideas and they're told by the regular member, like, you're new here. Learn the way it goes. Sit down. You don't get to talk yet. And they just kind of squash them. It's the attitude when they say, I've done my time on this board or that board. I've done what I'm supposed to do. I've never ventured off the farm. I kept the rules. I worked hard. Let some of the new people do some of the work for a change. I've been working around my dad's farm for 30 years. Let some of the new people carry some of the slack. I'm tired. It's the attitude that service to their father is actually drudgery. And it comes through loud and clear that they would rather be doing nearly anything else than serving in the house of God. What Jesus is trying to show us is that both the older brother and the younger brother missed the point all along of where life is found. Think about it, church. The younger brother thought he would find life out living wildly. That's why he demanded his money and get off the father's farm. Like, I'm never going to experience real life unless I go backpack through Europe, unless I get off, uh, get out of Salina. I'm never going to experience real life unless I go have a college experience. I'm never going to experience real life. I got married so young, so I need to get a divorce because I can't experience real life. I was just trapped in this life, so they want to wander away from the house of God. I'm going to go and live. And the older brother thought, if I just grind away, if I just follow all the rules, that's how I'll experience life. And and the father's like, life was in a relationship with me the entire time. Did you notice that that's what he said back to the younger brother, the older brother in verse 31? You were always with me. The idea being like, you, you were always with me. You always had a relationship with me. That's where life is actually found. It's not found in the work. It's not found in being a slave. It's not found in doing the work on the Father's house. It's not found away from the Father's house. It's found in a relationship with the Father. Some of you grind away in the church 
hoping your God in heaven will notice you and give you your heart's desires. And when it doesn't happen, you grow bitter towards your God in heaven. Why did I even serve on this board if God would let me lose my marriage? Why am I even giving if I would lose my job? Why am I doing this if God would let this happen to me? And it just reveals you were only ever doing any of that because you thought you'd get something from it. What if service to the Lord was actually supposed to come out of that relationship with the Father? What if instead of just slaving away for the Father, you spent time with the Father and then out of devotion for what he's done in your life, for saving you, for bringing a relationship to you, then you went and served out of it? So when you went into the field and worked, it wasn't like, I'm, I'm working so that someday I earn my father's respect. I'm working so that someday I earn part of the inheritance. I'm working because someday this estate will be mine. Instead, you changed your mindset and said, I serve the house of God because God loves me. I serve Jesus Christ because he loves me and he died for me. And so it seems simple that I would serve out of obedience to that love. That you said yes to doing hard things in the church. You said yes to living generously and giving of your money. You said yes to serving with the kids. You said yes to working on the property, doing different things. You said yes to evangelism. You said yes to, to discipleship. Not because you felt like you had to earn it, but because you already are in relationship with God. And you're like, everything I, he has is mine, so why wouldn't I walk in obedience to him? Both brothers show the ditch we can fall into in life. Church, the second we look for life in our hard work for God instead of looking for life in God, we will fail. We will get bitter. We will bottom out. The second we look for life in this world outside of God's house and outside of a relationship with him, we will fail. We will get bitter. And life will get hard. Life comes from a relationship with the Father. It's admittedly slower, it's admittedly a more modest life than what the world puts forward to satisfy your soul, but it is the only thing that will truly satisfy your soul. So what brother do you find that you tend to be? Are you the one that's looking for life outside of the house of God, or are you the one grinding away in the house of God hoping God will notice you, when in reality... Life always begins and ends with relationship to the Father. Would you pray with me as the worship team comes forward? God, I thank you that you are loving and kind, not just to the younger brother, but you show such grace to the older brother when he reveals the wickedness of his heart too. Lord, we are going to sing this song of worship, good, good Father, in recognition that you are indeed that. You are a good father who loves all his children, the wayward and the hard-hearted. God, and you're welcoming all of us home to a relationship with you. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.